Good evening, everyone. It's lovely to see you all here and grouped together in such a cohesive, friendly group towards the front of the theatre, so thank you. I'd also like to ask you to please um, remember to have your mobile phones turned off and not to use any of those devices for taking photographs. Thank you. I'd also like you now to welcome Caro Sisley, Alan Sisley's wife. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. I'd just like to welcome you all to this first Alan Sisley oration. And on behalf of Alan's family, Henry and Clive and Anita, Alan's mother Lynette and his brother Michael and myself, and to thank Gregson Edwards and the Fogg team for organising this event, and also to Edmund Capon for being our first orator. Thank you. <laughs> Caro just mentioned the name Gregson Edwards. Some of you, although it's hard to believe, may not yet have encountered it, Gregson. He's a key member of Friends of the Orange Regional Gallery, and I think you should know a little bit more about the man who will introduce our esteemed guest tonight. Gregson's career in public relations and media began in Orange, funnily enough, at our local ABC radio station, and it's taken him from Darwin to Japan, the Netherlands to Beijing, and Canberra to Tokyo. He has consorted with princes, parried with prime ministers, and been an acute recorder of seismic events in Tiananmen Square, in post Suharto, Indonesia, in Banda Aceh after the tsunami. Such high-pressure jobs demand a release, and Gregson's irreverence, his sense of the ridiculous, and his capacity to joke in the midst of crises must have been an asset. So too is his lifelong interest in the visual arts, both collecting art and assisting artists and galleries. On his return to Orange, Gregson joined the Friends of the Gallery, and his ideas, infectious enthusiasm, and never-give-up attitude make him a great, if occasionally formidable, committee member. It was Gregson's brilliant idea that Fogg celebrate Alan Sisley's Sisley life by initiating the Alan Sisley Memorial Oration. And so it is fitting that he introduce our inaugural speaker. Please welcome Gregson Edwards. Even I didn't know some of that. Um, I've had the good fortune of knowing Edmund Capon for some 20 years. Our paths first crossed in Tokyo and later in Jakarta. Then about 14 years ago, back in Australia, Edmund was very supportive of a project that I was working on at the time. For someone of his status, as he was then, director of the Art Gallery of New South Wales, Ed Edmund was very uh, accessible, remarkably so. In fact, one didn't have to make an appointment. Instead, if one hung about under the Morton Bay figs near the gallery, one would inevitably pick up the scent of Edmund's exquisite Cuban cigar. Then it was just a matter of one following one's nose. Edmund's scholarship in the visual arts and his achievements during his 33 years at the Art Gallery of New South Wales have earned him wide recognition. In addition to his AM from the Australian Government and OBE from Great Britain, he has also been honoured by the governments of Italy and France. But perhaps the best readout on Edmund Capon can be found in the various judgments passed by some of his Australian contemporaries. In the words of the often acerbic John MacDonald, quote, in a nutshell, Edmund was the most successful gallery director this country has ever known. He took the Art Gallery of New South Wales from obscurity to a rather successful position. When he arrived, the gallery was a pretty sleepy place. He didn't create the Archibald Prize, but he certainly made it into something much bigger than it ever was. He turned on the showbiz flair and turned the Archibald into something of a major media event. Another art critic, Sebastian Smee, took a different tack, which I think gets close to the real reasons behind Edmund's success. Smee points to Edmund's charm and his finely honed people skills. <laughs> 
When Edmund was near the end of his time at the gallery, Smee wrote as follows. Capon, of course, is an employee of the New South Wales government, which makes his success and, more to the point, his longevity remarkable. What stupendous self-control. What unnatural forbearance it must have taken as a representative of culture to stay on the right side of the thugs, opportunists and fools who've held power in New South Wales for so long. <laughs> he has done it and he has made a success of it. Three decades on, the Art Gallery of New South Wales is a vastly improved institution. Quoted in the Sydney Morning Herald of 11 August 19, uh, 20, 000, uh, 2011, the art dealer Michael Reed was effusive in his praise of Capon's acknowledged ability to cultivate donors. Said Reed, one of the great moments in my professional life was when I literally saw Edmund reach into some large donor's pocket, take out their wallet and remove all the money all in the most incredibly charming manner, for the right reasons. And everybody walked away a winner. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to the distinguished art authority, connoisseur of fine cigars, and accomplished pickpocket, Edmund Capon. Impossible that you might want that. Oh, it's my wallet. <laughs> what a privilege it is to come here. Thank you. Um, I was saying the other day, I actually remember, I think it was about 1980, my very first visit to, to Orange. It was a long time ago. And I, I'll tell you what happened. There was somebody here whose name you will all know, and uh, I was involved with the gallery. I was doing something or other, which I can't remember. And I came up and I thought, well, it'll be a nice, quiet, early night. I'll get early back the next day. I got to bed at 4 a.m. in the morning. Great place for a knees up, orange. <laughs> anyway, I wanted, no, this is, a, it is a huge privilege. And now I saw that this is called an oration. Now, I don't know about you think of an oration. It all sounds sort of rather serious and earnest, something rather dignified, something that's likely to be dignified by immortality. Um, I have to say that what I will say tonight will probably be touched by instant mortality, but still. Alan Sisley, of course, we all knew. We knew him as a colleague, and of course we were dealing with him in various ways over the years. And he was very much an individual. And of course, like all individuals, he had his own idiosyncrasies. We do. The most extraordinary of which was Morris dancing. But he liked rugby too, didn't he? He liked rugby football or something like that. There is only one football, and it's played with a round ball, please not. <laughs> anyway, Morris dancing. My parents lived in a small village in Kent, and I used to have to go and see them uh, um, you know, regularly when I was over there. And they did Morris dancing in the village square of this place called Rutum in Kent. You might have, and I thought it was the weirdest, weirdest pursuit I've ever seen in my life. I mean, grown people putting little things in all over their places and corn in their ears and little bells on their ankles. Uh, it was one of the weirdest antics I've ever, uh, ever experienced. Anyway, I've called this talk The Liberation of Australian Art. And yeah, to borrow a, a phrase, the, a subtitle, The Tyranny of Place. Um, some of you might, I hope, not agree with what I'm going to say. But it's all a consequence of my own experiences over three decades. In the three and a I think about 3.3 decades that I spent at the art gallery here in, in Sydney, there were two questions I would endlessly be asked and one major irritation that I never succeeded in dispelling. Now the questions were, predictably enough, 
The first one, who in your view is the greatest Australian artist, blah, 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 etc., etc., and who will be the next? You know, the most obvious questions. The irritation was something slightly different. And my great frustration was not ever succeeding in organising a great exhibition of Australian art overseas. Something, of course, that we know Alan did succeed in doing in 2006 with his Outsiders exhibition here. Now, whether we like it or not, it seems a fact that the art of Australia, the visual arts that is, remains something of a mystery to the wider world. Australian art, you know, Australian painting and sculpture, is a largely unknown quantity around the world. And this is a matter that has for years both vexed, bewildered and irritated me. That's not at all to say that nobody likes Australian art. It's just that it tends to remain so little known. Now, when you think of the very successful image of Australian cultural and artistic achievement around the world, you know, particularly in the realms of music, the cinema, literature, you know, one wonders how and why it is that the visual arts have received such a relative lack of recognition. After all, just think of the, you know, the Australian you know, artistic achievers in so many disciplines that have made such a huge um, achievement around the world, achieved great recognition, sometimes notoriety, and made a hugely acknowledged impact. They come flooding into mind, from Joan Sutherland to Mark Newsom, the designer, to Jermaine, the pretty germs, to, to Patrick White, David Malouf, from Barry Humphreys to Peter Weir, Baz Luhrmann to the ubiquitous Kate Blanchett. But let's face it, the names of our classic, modern, and even not so modern, painter heroes, Street and Boyd, Whiteley, Drysdale, even Sid, even Nolan, are barely known and little recognised. And I've become, over the years, I became sort of obsessed with this issue. And I've started to think about how could this be? And I have a sort of theory and a few thoughts about the matter. In 1961, the uh, English art critic and curator Brian Robertson did Australian art a huge service. When he staged an exhibition at London's then I'm sure many of you have been there, most avant-garde public art museum, the Whitechapel Gallery in the East End of London. That show was titled Recent Australian Painting, and it featured the work of artists well known to us, of course, like Drysdale here. Um, but all these artists are pretty much unknown elsewhere. Um, Whitey, both these pictures were actually in that, that very exhibition. All those familiar names, Nolan, Boyd, Whiteley, Laurie Dawes, Drysdale, Balson, Pugh, Blackmore, Olsen, Smart, they were all in that 1961 exhibition. There had been one or two other more modest exhibitions overseas, mainly in London in the 1950s and early 60s, all of which tended to portray the art of Australia as something mildly exotic. And even the Whitechapel, show, which with Brian Robertson in charge of it, he, he was a very cerebral curator and he took a far more serious and highly regarded view of Australian art, but even then the, it was perceived by the media to be something sort of, I think one of the papers called it adorable exotica, if you please. And there was as um, you know, a guy called Simon Pierce, who I think he's from Aberystwyth, you know, some, one of those those extraordinary Welsh towns with, with 120 words and one vowel. Um, he, do, he wrote a book called Australian Artists in London from 1950 to 65. And uh, he said there was an almost ubiquitous misconception of Australian art among British critics at the time. And bear in mind that they were the only ones who were really interested anyway. And this is a quote from that book. He said, Brian Robertson twice reviewed the exhibition. I thought this was a good wheeze, you know. You curate an exhibition, and then you, you're the critic as well. It's one way, it's one very short, quick way to a reasonably good review. Well, now, and he said, once for uh, London Magazine, he did it, and once for the Sunday Telegraph. 
In both these articles, he centred on the concept of Australian art as a product of the remote and the exotic. Uh, as a quote from the Sunday Telegraph notes, in a va- this is Robertson's words, in a vast Pacific world bordered by New Guinea and fringes on one side by the primitive Torres Strait Islands comes the exoticism that sometimes floods through Australian art. Now, such observations as that imply a view that must have been fairly well implanted at the time into what might be termed the British art scene. And then I happened to come across an observation of the critic John Berger, who, writing in the the journal Mianjin on another of those early shows, 12 Australian Artists, that was held in 1953 uh, in Burlington House, he noted something about what he called national traditions in art that such tradition implies generally accepted standards, the integration of the artist into society, and above all, art having a place in the lives of the majority of the people. Now, that's a kind of quote which um, was current then, but John Berger, who I I used to meet a few times in my my Maoist days, um, Berger was, as you probably know, a serious Marxist art critic. But in the same piece, He also wrote uh, of that same Australian show, this is 1953, as one walked through the gallery, one became Mm. conscious of a climate, a conditioning of life, a type of landscape, a quality of light, which seemed specifically Australian. Despite superficial differences, there are overall Australian characteristics. A common unity of atmosphere was established. And, of course, that was exactly right. It was an art absolutely tied, identified, shaped and defined by place. Now, I think we have to thank Robert Hughes and Brian Robertson. Robert Hugh- Bob Hughes was involved with that 1961 show at the Whitechapel. Uh, he was actually a, an artist at that time, too. You know, as we know, he's a um, failed artist turned to criticism, which is, <laughs> which is exactly what Bob did. Um, But they were at least, I think, making a start, or trying to make a start, on releasing Australian art from that stranglehold of the perceived exotic place. And uh, then at least seeking to gain recognition for Australian art abroad. There was a little preface to that catalogue, the the 1961 uh, Whitechapel show, by Lord Civilization, Kenneth Clark. You know, the man who discovered Sid Nolan. Just before I came here, um, I, I, Lord, Lord Civilization, Kenneth Clark, uh, said, no, I mean, you must come and have lunch with me before you go to Australia. I said, that's a good idea. And uh, it's one of those little moments I won't forget because he lived in a place called Albany, which is that lovely little uh, grove of houses between Burlington Street and Piccadilly. It's very, it's frightfully exclusive. And um, so I turned up at the appointed time and here was this great man, I mean, he was quite elderly then, a man who did Civilization, you know, the, the great television series. And he, he, he was a great fan of Sid Nolan, a great friend of Sid Nolan, and he was a great supporter, and he was very keen to get Australian art seen around the world as well. And, uh, see, he, but he actually cooked lunch himself. And then he said, I'll oh, come and sit down, sit down in my study, and on the, I should remember, forget this, there, well, there's the desk, on the wall was the great Turner that his son then sold for, uh, when, after he died. Uh, Kenneth Clark died, the son sold it. Alan Clark, you know, the politician, um, you know, for dozens of millions of pounds. And um, he said, oh, sit down, sit down. Oh, just move that, move that. But that was, was a beautiful Raphael drawing to get it out of the way of the spaghetti at the time. <laughs> Um, anyway, he wrote in the foreword, there is something about the light and the dead white trees and the feeling of Australian myth. I want to come back to myth in a minute. In fact, in his catalogue essay, you know, the young Mr. Hughes, as I said, who was also a painter, he had one, one painting in the show, he wrote, to think of Australia as a jardin exotique is a fashionable way of missing the point. For painters here, it is not an exotic garden, it is where we live. 
But, of course, in merely making that point, he was actually emphasising just that point, that Australia was then perceived to be an exotic, as it was distant. And so, in an odd, but I suppose understandable way, its painters were presumed to paint an exotic world and to behave in an exotic manner too. And in fact, at that time, and to some extent a direct result of that Whitechapel show, there was a genuine and enthusiastic interest in Australian painting at that time, particularly in, in England and in Europe. And I know because you know, I was there and I went to those shows. But it really was limited to there. Then two years after that, I've just got to do a little sort of background here. Mm -hmm. Bear with me. There was um, a big show at the Tate Gallery in 1963, which had begun life as this thing called the Antipodean Vision at the Adelaide Festival in 1962. And that same show was just, after a huge amount of effort and a lot of debate and blah, 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 it actually got shown in, um, uh, this was one of the paintings in that show, the uh, Walls of China which is now in the Art Gallery of New South Wales, another Drysdale. Um, it was shown in Canada. So that there was at least some Australian art that had some currency uh, within that sort of Anglo-Saxon Celtic realms of the Commonwealth, but very, very limited. Now, as I said, I, I can recall seeing both the Tate and the White Chapel shows. And yes, I can also add that there really was this faintly exotic sensibility, a hint of contrived myth. And both shows were, of course, to be viewed against a background of what was the current thing in London and the other you know, places around the, the, the Western world, and for people like myself. What was the current thing? We were then, of course, looking at great flashy moments by Motherwell, Klein, Jackson Pollock. We were looking at pop art by Warhol, Lichtenstein, and, and Richard Hamilton. And even we were looking at the École de Paris of Howard Hot, you know, the abstract painters from Paris, Hartung, Soulage, and English painters like Howard Hodgkin. So you could see, against that kind of gregarious and cosmopolitan background, Australian painting did indeed look slightly out of sorts, remote and otherworldly. But there was also an aura of a kind of mythological exotic earnestness. Now the selection of artists in that famous Whitechapel show I think was very much a selection of its time. Note, out of the, there were 55 artists in the show, just two women artists and absolutely no Aboriginal artists, no rep, Aboriginal representation whatsoever. But it also tended to reflect you know, Brian Robertson's taste and predilection for the then fashionable abstract expressionism. And even though the more radical Australian art of the late 50s and the early 60s was still really a figurative art, uh, you know, here's just a few names. Charles Blackman, for example, Boyd, both Arthur and David, Dobell, Dickerson, Fairweather, Juniper, Mulvick, Nolan, Olsen, Percival, Pugh, Smart, Tucker, Whiteley, they, all, they were all in that 1963 show as well. They were all figurative artists, but, you know, with, with Robertson's taste, with, I think, a certain abstract and expressionist sort of flavour to them. Interestingly, as a sign of the then paradoxical art contest that was going on in Australia, I'm sure you all remember about it, the show was severely criticised, the 1963 Tate show, was severely criticised by Bernard Smith and his uh, so-called Antipodean group, which championed the cause of figurative art with a rather more restricted view of the genre. They deemed the likes of Drysdale, Boyd and Whiteley as beyond the figurative pale. I, I'm sure some of you have seen some of the, con the, 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 the quotes from, that, um, from uh, Bernard Smith. I, one of the last times I saw Bernard Smith, he was a terrific character. Um, he, um, he must have been a, for an Archibald Prize about 12 years ago, and he was 80, mid-80s, and this lady in Melbourne wanted to paint him, and he said, okay, you can paint me, but only in the nude. 
And there was a big painting of Arthur, I mean, of, of, of um, Bernard Smith, sitting there like this, everything displayed, you know, this sort of flaccid member hanging there in front of you. Um, it was the most extraordinary thing. I asked him, I said, he said, well, what do you do that for? He said, well, I decided I hadn't been painted in the nude before. I said, well, I did say to him, it's unlikely to happen again. So, Anyway, uh, Bernard had a good turn of phrase, as you probably know, and uh, I just was looking up some of them um, in condemning those sloppy, messy artists who were inclined towards abstraction and expressionism. Uh, this is one, a couple of quotes. Today, Tashi said to expressionism, action painters, geometric abstractionists, and their innumerable band of camp followers threatened to benumb the intellect and wit of art with their bland, pretentious mysteries. And even better, he said, destroy the living power of the image and you have humbled and humiliated the artist, have made him a blind and powerless Samson, fit only to grind the corn of Philistines. Oh, that's a terrific phrase, I think. <laughs> we can use that when we're talking about our politicians and all kinds of people. Talk back radio. Anyway, it was that short-lived period, uh, it was all rather brief and... Uh, a bit, a, a bit parochial, but quite fun, of, of the figs, i.e. the figuratives against the abs, the abstractionists. So that's, how it was, that's how it's remembered. Anyway, after all that, to be honest, not much happened. And it was over 50 years later that the opportunity to present the art of Australia to the wider world in a really substantive way presented itself. And you probably know that late in 2013, at the Royal Academy in London, the long-awaited Art of Australia show opened. The Royal Academy is arguably one of the great venues for shows like this, and with a tremendous, and I can vouch for this, a lot of people are a bit cynical about this, an absolutely interested and willing audience. People were really looking forward to this show. They were waiting in anticipation. And as I think we all now know, it was sad, sadly, roundly criticised. And I have to say, justifiably so, at the opening, I was towards the end. Um, yeah, a lot of people came up and said, hey, well, what's going on here? You know, and, but the, the classic, I can't use the, the, the words cause, exactly because it would be too rude, too rude. Uh, but I got a tap on the shoulder and there was Jermaine Greer. And, and Germ said, Airman, what the is this bit of doing here? Uh, and carried on in, for some time. And she wrote, I mean, the, some of the reviews that were awful. Uh, and, and some of them were actually I, so awful, they were stupid. Um, and, and in fact, ultimately, uh, hers was pretty stupid too. It was just over the top. But the, one of the things that intrigued me was that, apart from anything else, um, I mean, there were, I, well, I won't go into the, the show because that, that's another story, uh, but apart from anything else, its declared theme was to focus on the influence of the landscape. Now, in the 21st century, I think that was far too prescriptive, with an inevitable tendency to pander to those views of the past five decades or five decades ago and as I hope to show now, is no longer the defining or persuasive premise for the art of Australia. Enough has been written, as I said, about the RA show, and really this isn't the place to, to, to go into it. But I would say this, um, that, I mean, even John McDonald was, was, was you know, he's, he did say, understandably, and I felt hugely disappointed. He was this great opportunity that somehow went off the rails. Uh, but I took a lot of people around, some Americans and French people around, you know, and, and yeah, whatever, the, however indifferent the show was, they loved it because they said, we don't see paintings like this. I mean, it's all new territory. Anyway, but it is very much the part of the story that I would like to address. That is the recognition and image of Australian art in the wider world. And in ruminating on this issue, I've noticed one or two incidents that have bewildered me about the laboured travels of Australian art around the world. Firstly, going back to those, those um, early Whitechapel and Tate shows, in 1965, 
somebody called Anthony Armstrong Jones, Lord Snowden, the photographer, Brian Robertson and John Russell, another great critic, produced a large coffee table book called Private View. It was about the then very lively, yeah, it was the swing 60s in London, the very lively British art world, and all its main protagonists, all the great artists were there. It was a hugely popular book, as it turned out. It was a big coffee table book of the artists in their shoes. Nobody had done anything like this before. And it was a time when I was you know, getting very much involved um, in, the, in the business of art, etc. And slightly to my surprise, there were two Australian artists included in that book, Sid Nolan and Whiteley. Okay, they were living in London at the time, and you've got to acknowledge that, but, but uh, British artists, they were not. They were Australian artists. And I thought, that's really odd. Then, uh, decades later, I was at the Tate Gallery in London on a quest to borrow this picture. You know, one of Sid's great Central Australian uh, pictures. It's, uh, it's in the Tate Gallery. And I went to see them, and this was for our big 2007 and 8 Sid Nolan exhibition. So it was, in, bear that in mind, because it's well after the opening of Tate Modern. The Tate Britain and Tate Modern. I was told that the painting was in Tate Britain, not Tate Modern, in Tate Britain. I then discovered that all the other Australian works held by the Tate, by Fred Williams, Arthur Boyd, Brett Whiteley, etc., were also under the aegis of Tate Britain. And it struck me again as something a bit odd. There seemed to be this indelible association there that Australian art did not, it seemed, belong on its own. But uh, we had a chat with, with the then director, with Nick Sorota, about it. And I'm happy to say that last year, that very painting is now hanging in Tate Modern, which is a step very much in the right direction. Um, there have been a number of other shows of Australian art around the world in the last half century or so, mostly of modest scale and aspiration, and which, to be honest, have really made but a, a modest consolidated impact. In 1983, for example, we at the Art Gallery of New South Wales organised a, a show called uh, Moon and Moment, a century of Australian land, landscape painting, which went off to the National Gallery of Art in Beijing, went to Shanghai, Guangzhou, and we did a very similar one in, in Japan as well, in Tokyo and Kyoto. Um, and then, of course, uh, John Calder did a very different thing, a very important show, which I think is still being overlooked in uh, Australian accent in PS1 in, in uh, um, New York, and it was shown in Washington, uh, with immense, just three artists, Immense Tillers, Mike Parr, and Ken Unsworth. This is the Mike Parr. Mike Parr with his always, poor Mike, is always, he's always hurting himself. He wants to share his pain with you all. There he is. I have a self-portrait of Mike, the uh, big one uh, at home, and uh, I've never known anybody present, you know, do, do themselves so much harm as Mike Powell, but he is a wonderful artist. And there was an interesting review of this show by the critic John Russell, who wrote, for, I think, for the New York Times. He said, they're, picked, they're talking about, you know, Powell, Russell, and uh, Imance Tillers. Their pictures come freighted with dreams of a complex and disquieting kind. And the idioms employed allow of a rapid and comprehensive attack upon a range of problems, emotional, conceptual, aesthetic, and perceptual. And I think there, there's a hint of that quest to be part of other things, but different, not unlike their predecessors. But back to that, moment, that Australian landscape painting. There was, of course, a perfectly reasonable and legitimate subtitle, uh, you know, A Century of Australian Landscape. But for me, in retrospect, I think therein lies something of the problem. We all know and acknowledge two decisive moments in the history of Australian art that have so profoundly conditioned the image and the journey of Australian art. Two moments of what I call national identity. Firstly, of course, with the Heidelberg School, when artists like Robert Street and McCubbin, Walter Withers, Jane Southern, etc., all painted en plein air for the first time and they captured not merely the appearance of the landscape, but its texture too. The breath and the air, the feeling of being in that landscape. 
The sultry heat and dust of Streetman's fire zone captures the climate, the atmosphere, the torrid air, and that pervasive blue sky. It captures those things far, far more than it does the moment of human drama, which, of course, is the, the subject of the narrative here. And thus was born the notion of Australian Impressionism, a genre that was unique to Australia. Paintings that have come from absolutely no other place than Australia, bound and tied by that commitment to describing the experience of the Australian landscape. Now, it seems to me that looking at that, you know, that, trying to paraphrase the journey of Australian art a bit, that much the same thing happened after the Second World War in the late 40s and the 1950s, with truly modern painters like Drysdale again, this is Sofala, um, Tucker, Boyd, Nolan, Percival, Fred Williams, all created a visual language that had an absolutely undeniable sense of place to it, place and identity. Just think of these pictures, like the Drysdale, the Williams, and even, even, just, even John Olson. This is one of the pictures that went to London show, which was described in the most appalling terms by one of the critics there, a man with, uh, of Polish origin with, with an unpronounceable name, but actually quite, normally quite a good critic. But these works of these artists demonstrate a determined and successful quest, for, this is how I see it now, for independence and affirmation. And at that time, I remember talking to, to Sid and to Arthur Boyd about their, their, their instincts and their feelings. At that time, I think it was perhaps a flight from the, the horrors of the Second World War and of, you know, that was preceded by a Great Depression. Both then very much within living memory. They demonstrate a real attachment to the Australian experience and above all to the Australian landscape. It was, I think, a very deliberate exercise in seeking to establish identity within the context of a European tradition, and yet at the same time seeking to, see that, that, to distance itself from a disagreeable immediate past. And whilst Drysdale and Williams, for example, captured those very distinctive textures and, and the temperature, what I call the climate of the landscape, so do, did Nolan and Arthur Boyd, but they were different. Uh, for them, the landscape was far more of a stage for the human drama and experience, which they then inserted into that unique Australian experience of the landscape, thereby creating, a, to me, a slightly contrived mythological context and status for Australian painting, albeit one essentially of a European and classical measure. What all their work has in common is that indelible sense of national identity, which we can identify with and to some extent confirm or reaffirm our own backgrounds. It's rather like you know, the, the great cultural monuments drive of the late 19th and 20th centuries when our city fathers we, you know, were busy building you know, important civic buildings and cultural buildings and art galleries and libraries, all of them in the image of the British Museum, it seemed to me. You look at half the, you know, the, the South Australia Gallery, the Art Gallery of South Wales, the State Libraries here. They, they're great sort of monuments to, 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 to neoclassicism. It's all quite understandable as a quest of its time. But let's face it, it's arguable that the only true mythological status that can be attributed to art in Australia is that of the indigenous traditions. And yet strong as that image of that quintessential Australian landscape, as immortalised by its early progenitors, Street and Roberts, and then uh, by reimagined by Nolan, Drysdale, and Williams, etc., etc., and maybe continues to, to be a struggle, it has nonetheless certainly struggled for any kind of serious recognition beyond Australian shores with the possible exception of that brief golden era of Australian art in London in the, in the sort of the late 50s and particularly in the 60s. And which, you know, that was my first real contact. And I 
I frequently ask myself the question, why? Why is this so? Why was the convincing achievement of those national styles and identities, the achievements of our foremost artists, whether at the moment of so-called Impressionism at the end of the 19th century or its modern equivalent in the late 40s, 50s and early 60s, why was it such a seeming hindrance to recognition, even interest around the world? There was, as we know, an interest in indigenous art, stimulated, of course, by the notion of the exotic and the different. This was new sort of frontier territory for the traditional Western museum curator and exemplified, I think, in an exhibition that was verging on the academic and, to be honest, in that slightly, you know, slightly patronising way uh, of, of the French, of, the, of that Gallic way. But at the same time, it was a revelatory exhibition, Magician de la Terre, that was held at the Pompidou Centre in Paris in 1989. That included work by three Aboriginal artists, but they were all bark painters. And it must be admitted that that was a, a show of ethnographical rather than artistic context. But it was an interesting show. It was one of the first times that, uh, in, in, in the context of a big, major international show in a major, major museum, uh, 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 and not in the Anglo-Saxon world, but in, in France, that Aboriginal painting was seen. And interesting, it was such a success that only last year, 2000, yeah, 2014, they actually uh, they rekindled the whole show at the Pompidou. By then, in the, the late uh, in the 1980s, Australian Aboriginal art had become something of a standard bearer for Aboriginal arts around the world, and that was all fine. But such recognition did not represent the whole spectrum of modern and contemporary Australian art activity and aspiration. In fact, the powerful presence of contemporary Aboriginal art on the international horizon, I think, tended to sort of obfuscate the broader spectrum of Australian art. The revelation of Papania Tool and Western Desert Painting had, of course, great and far-reaching, I think, quite understandable impact. I think we're all familiar with that, that sort of great renaissance of indigenous art that had its origins in Papania Tula in the early 1970s. A revelation that has since inspired Aboriginal... This is Clifford Possum. Uh, you know, the ancient traditions into a modern idiom. And we've probably all heard that, uh, you know, that famous comment that attributed to Bob Hughes, um, saying that... Um, what did he say? Oh, the last great art movement of the 20th century. When I asked him about it, he said he couldn't remember ever having said it, but that's all right. He didn't remember a lot of things he said. Um, Le Le Les, but actually, like Les, Mur Les Murray made a comment about it, and he said, oh, this, this whole thing about you know, Panya Tool and paintings like Tip of Possum here was, American, uh, was Australia's equivalent of jazz or visual jazz. But the fact is that here we have a visual language of unique origin and vision, one deeply enshrined in its history, traditions and place, and yet remarkably wholly contemporary in spirit, aesthetic and appeal. It's absolutely an art determined by place, fully informed by place and tradition, but nonetheless not prescribed by that place. In fact, quite the reverse, because as we know, uh, you know Contemporary Aboriginal art has travelled and still travels around the world very well. Western desert painting became the standard bearer for Australian art around the world. And in that, the year of that, that great festival of running, jumping and standing still called the Olympics, um, we did a big show at Papania, which Hetty Perkins curated. This is just one of, one of, the, one of the many images. And you can understand why people could respond to this. It's, it's, it's abstract, and yet it's got, that, it's got a sense, it's got some, it, the authenticity of antiquity and place inscribed into it. Some 50 artists were included in this show. It was a big show. It was an absolutely beautiful exhibition. I'm sure many of you um, would have seen it. And it was the first to really provide a comprehensive look at this ancient genre in its contemporary garb. And I recall, amongst the many people I took round the show, was the then Italian Minister of Culture, somebody called Giovanni Melandri. Uh, 
And she came, I think, at least twice to the show. And she was absolutely entranced by it and determined to get this show of Papagnatula to Europe, to Italy, and then hopefully elsewhere in Europe. And we went there, Hetty and I went there, we met, we, did, we tried and tried and tried, and nothing happened. Uh, in spite of our best combined efforts, we did not succeed. Happily, though, others have succeeded in this particular venture uh, where I failed, and actually only last year there was a, a major Aboriginal exhibition that toured a number of venues throughout China. Then there was another great celebratory exhibition. And these are the kind of things where I, I felt I was you know, banging my head against a brick wall. Golden Summers, you remember that show? Well, back in the, the late 80s, mid to late 80s. The pick of Australian paintings from that great era of first national identity, the Heidelberg School and beyond. It had just about every national icon in it, including, of course, Golden Sweetens, famous Golden Summers, Sir Golden Summer. Eaglemont, from which the show took its name. Now, among the many notables we took through that show was the then legendary curator and chairman of the Department of Modern Art at the Metropolitan Museum in New York, somebody called Bill Lieberman. Bill was a great character, a great friend of Australian, a great friend of Australian art, and he truly loved Australian painting. Not just the focus of this particular show, but he loved, you know, things like, you know, the Fred Williams, John Olson, Tim Stoyer, I told him to see Tim. And he's, uh, um, you know, he's another of our artists who's hugely evocative and meticulously rendered works are very much, they're still sort of defined to a large extent by their sense of place. And of course, Whiteley, uh, Bill loved Whiteley. But try as I might, and, and I could not persuade, he could not be persuaded to do a major Australian show at the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And like we talked about it endlessly. He said, I just don't think people will come. And they were, there was, it seemed to me, some mysterious stigma attached to the very notion of Australian art at the time. That Australia seemed irritatingly, or Australian art seemed rather irritatingly, destined to stay at home. But what of now? Has Australian art at least leapt over some of those irritating hurdles in recent years? In my view, absolutely. Uh, it is now a very different prospect, and above all, a much more encouraging, more gregarious one. Our contemporary artists are much less inclined to any commitment to that sense of place. Artists like Bill Henson, Tracy, Tracy Moffitt, Patricia Piccinini, Callum Morton, Ricky Swallow, Sean Gladwell, James Angus, look, at, look what you can do to a beautiful Bugatti. Michaela Dwyer, this is in the gallery, it's on show. Oh, I think it's on show. I don't know, I had nothing to do with that place. Um, now, all these are almost as well known and recognized, all those artists in, the, in Europe and America, and increasingly in Asia, as they are here in Australia. Their names are known in the global contemporary art world, whereas the likes of Jeffrey Smart, Fred Williams, John Olson, even Boyd and Drysdale, and other great pillars of the you know, Australian art scene are simply far less known, or barely known at all. And all that begs the question, why? What, what happened? And I think there is a, perhaps one simple answer and a whole raft of other possible causes. The simple reason to me is that those artists I've mentioned and the others that we'll look at of the contemporary world have largely shed that made in Australia label. That pervasive presence of the landscape in the Australian artist's psyche has been superseded by an urban culture and a global engagement and aspiration. The work of artists such as these does not betray any strong sense of place. And if it does so, then it is not the raison d'etre of the work, nor its defining characteristics. In a way, these are the marvellously voracious, indefatigable Tracy, Tracy Moffat, has alluded to this process when she said of her own attitude, in her own sort of wonderful and 
spirited and very independent way. She said she was not an Aboriginal artist, she was an artist who happens to be Aboriginal. That, of course, is not denying that she's an Aboriginal or an Aboriginal artist, but simply that in her role in life as an artist, the fact that she is Aboriginal is not really, for her, the defining issue. So she actually said that. And I'd like here to make what might be, appear to be a slightly sort of uh, tangential comparison with the American experience. What, for example, did the world know about American painting up to around the 1940s and 50s? Very little, I'd suggest. You think of American painting of the first half of the 20th century. The so-called American Impressionists, like William Merritt Chase, Childe Hassan, Twatchman, or those American post-Impressionists like Arthur Dowd and Charles DeMuth, or the social realists of the 20s and 30s like uh, Thomas Hart Benton, Ben Shah. Are there some names we know, like Hopper, perhaps, and, and George Bellows, etc.? They might be a little more familiar, but on the whole, in Europe, the Western world, and Australia, and elsewhere at the time, American painting, much like its Australian counterpart, was, if they were known at all, generally regarded as something parochial and derivative. Such art belonged, it seemed, in America and to America in much the same way the Australian art belonged to Australia. In America, that all changed with the great abstract expressionist movement of the New York School, which began to emerge in the late 1940s. Here was a flamboyant, gestural, urgent, and urban art that did not have to bear the cross of place or provincialism. And I remember well in London, in the late 50s and 60s, all these great muscle-flexing pictures by, you know, by Motherwell, Pollock, Frankenthaler, and, and uh, Franz Klein. I used to go every Sunday afternoon to the Tate Gallery. The main motive, uh, I went with a friend of mine, an American friend who was a student as well, the main, the, the first purpose was, was the best pickup joint in town, particularly on a Sunday. You never failed to score. And the other was to see these things, because they were absolutely, they were a revelation, this, this extraordinary dynamism and energy, how they captured the mood of urban pace uh, uh, and urgency. But the impact those pictures had around the world at the time was emphatic. It was a new, blatant, urgent, exciting, and universal global language. It was not just an American language, it was a global language. And that's when the world really took notice of American painting, because it was a universal expression, not a local condition. And in fact, it was American painting that had a little moment in my, in my life at the V&A. Before I came to the gallery, I was in the Far Eastern section at the V&A, just dealing with Chinese art, and we were in a, an attic, tucked away in the, that vast building. And one day, because I liked everything, you know, I'm right the other end of the building, so sort of half a mile away, and the other end of the V&A, the western end, they had a show of modern American watercolours. And here were the Kleins and the Motherwells and the Jules Zelitsky and, and I was Helen Frankenthaler. I met this artist and I like it. And I was looking at Helen Frankenthaler. This was just when I was deciding when I've been asked about the, coming to the job here, to, to the art gallery. And they say, I was in, living in a kind of inverted cone, going around in ever-decreasing circles in those big institutions. And I was looking at this, and it so happened, nobody else in that gallery, I was looking at the Helen Frankenthal, it's a little moment I remember, and the head of that department, a man called Dr. Michael Kaufman came up, he walked in, he looked at me, he said, hello, Edmund. He said, what are you doing here? I said, well, I'm looking at this. He said, but you're Asia, aren't you? <laughs> I mean, the idea that, you know... Anyway, my contention about this is that being liberated from that emotive sense of place was, for Australian art, a passport to a much wider and, to be honest, a much more appreciated world, a worldwide audience. For here we have images and imaginations not constrained or determined by a sense of place and its influence of national identity, but images dealing with ideas, notions, concerns that might just as well be located in Berlin, London, Beijing, Los Angeles, Mexico City or Tokyo or wherever. 
And it's a fact that many contemporary Australian artists have achieved recognition in those global art circuits like the Biennales of Venice and Sao Paulo, Istanbul, Singapore, etc., etc., Documentary in Castle, and right now the Hong Kong Art Fair, etc. And they've achieved the kind of international reputation and acknowledgement that those modern masters of Australian art, the Nolans, Drysdale, Williams, even Whiteley, seldom, if ever, achieved. And they did that simply, I think, because their art is not so wholly defined with place, that place being Australia. And I come back here yeah, to another... Com Oops, let's go back. Back to, to Tracy Moffat again. Perhaps, too, these artists, very much of our time, now in the 21st century, like her, see themselves as artists first and Australian artists second. That is, artists who happen to be Australian. There are, of course, a lot of extenuating circumstances in this. Every aspect of our world today is inevitably more global. The art world, absolutely so. I and mean, just think about what's happening in the art world now. You've got you know, Qatar, the state of Qatar, spending $350 million on a Gauguin painting. You think, what is going on? And then in the, and, and Abu Dhabi, I went to see a show at the Louvre, you know, they're opening the Louvre in Abu Dhabi. And here was this sort of this vacuum of Abu Dhabi buying up stuff. And it began with some uh, very early Buddhist things and, and early Chinese art, that some of which was okay and some was. And it finished with six great Sai Tomblis and was a bit of everything in between. The Sai Tomblis were terrific. And then you, you know, uh, his, you know, an Arab state building its own moon and uh, acquiring. Sai Twombly's by, by the meter. And then there was some lunatic a lot long ago spent 40, 40 million or 45 million dollars on an appalling Jean-Michel Basquiat. I mean, somebody here might like Jean-Michel Basquiat, but uh, um, I think he's just excruciating. And um, he died very young, as you probably have, which sort of adds value, I guess, I don't know. Um, he started life as a graffiti artist, you know, on trains in, in New York. Uh, but he was a, a, a black artist and he had, he had everything sort of, all the right things going for him. But I remember uh, when Bob Hughes, he, he did a show, his last show, I think it was a, a kind of, um, it's after he died. And, and Bob, who had the same view of me about Basquiat, wrote a piece for when he was critic for Time. And he titled it Requiem for a Featherweight. <laughs> anyway, that's. So, the, you know, the global world and the community artists have found much common ground to explore. Um, yeah, but having said that, I think our contemporary artists have given Australian art a real and convincing place in the world, which is, I think, a tremendous achievement. So who are these artists who put Australia onto the global art map? Well, I think it goes back three or more decades or so to that era of, of artists like Mike Parr, Imance Tillers, this is Imance, Pataphysical Man, Ken Unsworth, you know, the ones who were in the, the, PR1, the PS1 show that um, John Caldwell did, um, who sought inspiration to some extent direction from the mold-breaking artists dealing more with ideas than material objectivity. The conceptual art of the time, the, the Joseph Boyce, the Kiefer's, etc. of this world. And now we look to artists like Sean Gladwell for one. I used Sean a lot and I did a, a thing for the BBC and the ABC on television series on Australia, and we've used Sean, because he's terrific, and he's, he's wonderful to talk to. And um, Clive James, dear Clive, wrote a, a, a review of that television series for the, a publication in, in England. And he was very nice about it, very kind about it, except he said, I could not understand what on earth Edmund was doing talking to some young bloke riding about on a bike. <laughs> Apart from that, he was okay. <laughs> But, you know, Sean Glad was an artist who, through his work being exhibited in such events as the Biennale of Venice, 
uh, has achieved great international recognition, not only for himself but for Australian art. Nobody's denying that he's an Australian artist, and whilst he often but not inevitably uses Australian locations for his work, they are nonetheless not about place, nor are they defined and identified by any sen um, sense of place. The work that sort of launched him, in a way, was this thing, Storm Sequence, I'm sure many of you see it. It was shot at Bondi Beach. But as you can see, in weather that's clearly more London than Sydney or something. It's a video work about movement, about the suspension of real time to the pace and lyricism of a kind of visual poetry. This is a work that is urban with a resounding familiarity with its Berlin, Beijing, London or Sydney. It's a work in that sense of no fixed abode, a work be that belongs to the art of the world. Ditto this one. I love this one. This is in the gallery. It's called Willamanu Night. And he creates a kind of sort of Edward Hopper-like scene. It's a capoeira dancer, which is, I, you know, I asked him, I said, what, what's it? Oh, it's a, a dance developed from African slaves in Brazil. So he got this, this, this girl to dance around at night, at midnight, in, in a service station. Um, and this, she spins, she twists and lunges in movements to sort of echo the skills of self-defense and combat. And it's all orchestrated into this wonderful visual experience with, with that kind of, it's a universal image. And this is urban art, the, the marriage of performance and street culture. This is Gladwell's global world. It's just that it all happened in a service station in Sydney, in Woolloomooloo. And just to reaffirm my contention about Gladwell and his colleagues, last year alone, like 2014, Sean Gladwell exhibited in Toronto, London, Paris, Antwerp, Croatia, Istanbul, South Korea, Indonesia, and Melbourne. And I think in Baltimore, because he was just off when I last saw him there. Now, this is a far cry from a Williams or a Drysdale and their very deliberate, evocative expressions of a distinctively Australian experience. Like Gladwell, Bill Henson's quiet, at times almost sinister, evocations of human vulnerability explore the human condition in a universal sense. There's nothing parochial about Bill Henson's work. His interest lies not in any devotion to place, but in the vulnerabilities of the human condition. These sublime and often suspenseful works have, as we know, on occasions brought in images like this, a certain amount of unwanted speculation about the nature of his work. I don't agree with any of that. I'm a huge fan of his. It's mature, sophisticated, urbane, and quietly intense. This is one of my favourite images of Bill's. It's that Paris Opera series, which he did, you know, about 20 years ago. Almost 20 years ago, I think. Hold on. Um, 19, yeah. Uh, no, 14 years ago. He was commissioned by the Opera Garnier to go and do a series. Fascinating in a way. You, know, you ask, a, you invite an Australian photographic artist to go to Paris to do a series about the Paris Opera. And the Paris Opera asked Bill to do it. And you think, well, take images of the performances. There's not one. It's about the people looking at, at, the, at the opera, at the performance. I mean, that is an amazing image. And then about the sky outside at the same time. There's some beautiful sort of cloudscapes in that series. But when we look at images like this, we are left with a sense of hovering but sympathetic uncertainty. His work speaks to all, not of place, but of the human condition. They are resting in their familiarity, unnerving in their anonymity, but so, so eloquent in their vulnerable beauty. And the banner of contemporary Australian art around the world is similarly carried by artists like, like Patricia, Patricia Piccinini, um, and Ricky Swallow. Neither artist betrays any particular Australian identity in their work. Patricia explores here the frontiers between science and technology, technology on the one hand, and the fantasies of the human imagination on the other. Her work, in a way, questions our faith in technology, but it's inspired by our inherent human instinct for hope. For all the 
to the, the strangeness of her imagery, you actually, there's a sense of, of optimism that they evoke. But it's not, it's a universal language. Ricky Swallow is an artist very much of our time, one who looks for the kind of loving, almost nostalgic air at the bric-a-brac of our lives and then makes the most carefully crafted souvenirs of those objects. This is Killing Time. It's one of his most ambitious works. It's an echo of a 17th century Dutch still life, perhaps, but very much a memory of personal experience. Again, it's a work that's invested with a certain timelessness, a work that respects great traditions of craftsmanship, but above all, a work of no fixed abode. Swallow is an artist of the modern world, and he happens to be an Australian. The whole process of what one might call the global democratisation of the art of Australia in our times has also been, if not enabled, then certainly assisted by the changing demography of our community and our community of artists. Inevitably, the creative community of modern Australia is a reflection of its population makeup, and that, as we all know, is a mixed, as cosmopolitan as anywhere, possibly even more so now. Those more recently arrived creative spirits have brought with them differing and enlarging cultural heritages and sensibilities, and indeed aspirations, which may well, may well belong in Australia, but are not exclusive to Australia. And thus again, they belong to a wider sphere of interest. In this process, it must be recognised that artists from the broader Asian region have been, I think, of particular significance. And I think, for example, one of the artists who I really do admire, long admired, Hossein Valamir, came from Iran, went to Adelaide, went out into the, into the bush, and he made this work and called Longing Belonging. And it's obviously about the transmission of, of uh, you know, of... Uh, your own inherited traditions and bringing them to a new place. The, 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 the Persian carpet, the photograph uh, of the carpet being burnt in the bush, etc. What's he trying to do? Is he, is he bringing his past with him or is he trying to eradicate it? Then there are artists like Guan Wei, Arshien. This is Guan Wei. I opened his show in Sydney just last week with, uh, with, with Jeff Raby and uh, friend of Gregson's, and uh, who was our ambassador there. I mean, Guan Wei is a classic example of an artist bringing a different kind of encyclopedia, a different vocabulary, but it's, um, it, into the Australian experience, and then creating imagery that has a little hint of place, and a hint of China, and a hint of orange, a hint of this, into this wonderful cosmopolitan mix. Dardan Cristanto from Indonesia, this amazing work called... Um, Called they give evidence, which of course is a very poignant comment, political comment as well. And uh, yeah, Aboriginal artists, oh, of oh, this one too, Liu Xiaoxian, another Chinese artist, one of the band of Chinese artists who left after Tiananmen, huge works, made up of little tiny postage sized stamps images. And of course they're made up of the reverse. Here's two worlds meeting. The image of the figure of Christ with the thorns are lots of thousands or hundreds and hundreds of little tiny images of the image of Buddha on the right. And vice versa. The image of the Buddha is made up of little tiny, tiny images of the, the, the crown of thorn Christ. And the image on the right is, is Hote, the Maitreya, the future Buddha. And artists like Brooke Andrew here, uh, you know, and contemporary Aboriginal artists, they too, even, even the sense of place there, and Jonathan Jones, who uses fluorescent tubes, and, and Daniel Boyd, all these artists are, in a sense, uh, shedding the, the need, the feel, to make works of art that, that bespeak made in Australia. They have all contributed to this more gregarious and less overtly Australian image for our art in the late 20th and the 21st century. What's happened to Australia and Australia in the past three or four decades does rather put that famous comment by, you remember the minister, Arthur Caldwell, who's the, you know, the, the great pro-immigration 
I actually went back and looked this up. He was the great sort of pro-immigration minister in the, just after the Second World War, but he had very strict conditions. And he made a, a famous comment in Parliament in 1947 um, about two wongs do not make a white. Can you believe it? Yeah, you can actually, can you? But rather like a kind of cultural revolution, these artists from, uh, have helped to emancipate Australian art from the stranglehold of identity. And here I would even include some of our indigenous artists who work transcends a quest for identity, like Brook Andrew here. And whilst I all acknowledge that uh, we are all beholden to the very idea of an art and its traditions that belong strongly and emotionally to the identity of place. It's my belief that worthy, indelible in defining those traditions may be and are, they have nonetheless been a strange and unexpected kind of limitation to the liberation of Australian art to the world. What we can do now is applaud the maturity and sophistication of our new generation of truly international artists, from the likes of Bill Henson, Ricky Swallow and Sean Glebble to Hussein Balamanesh and, and you know, the contemporary Aboriginal artists. But we should always be mindful of the often fragile power of the now in the face of that ultimate critic, time. And I thought I'd just go back and I was looking at the list of artists represented in that famous 1961 exhibition at the Whitechapel, Brian Robertson Show. 55 artists. How many now do we still recognise? These were the artists who were defining Australia at the time. There's a whole raft of names there that don't mean anything to me. I probably, who remembers Don Laycock, John Lungi, Ross Murrow, Ian Sign, Roy Thompson? Huh? I don't remember. Does anybody? They were, the, they were in that famous Whitechapel show. So it's a rather sobering reflection upon the mortality of much once lauded art. But let's fit with a trip which, to Monday Monday. This is part of Sean Glabble's Maddis Maximus videos. It's so obviously an Australian location. And here Sean is doing that wonderful thing. He's slightly sort of menacing attitude on a motorbike and this mysterious journey, embracing the landscape on this ever opening, this ever unfolding landscape. It's a work that celebrates place, but is absolutely not prescribed by that place. And that, to me, has been the great liberation of Australian art. And let's applaud our artists now, who are being recognised around the world, long overdue. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Edmund. Uh, he went on far too, not too long at all. We really appreciated that. Um, and I'm sure that your erudition had sunk into us. And as we um, leave the hall, there are questions I'm sure that all of you will have and, and would like to um, throw at um, Edmund, and he will be down in the foyer very soon to parry your highly incisive questions, I'm sure. Are there lots of open doors down there? Yeah, <laughs> we won't let you out. Um, but we'd also um, like to present you with um, a small gift, which I hope will show that some of our regional artists, whose catalogues these are, have managed to go beyond that slightly yeah. patronising term, regional artist, yes. and show that indeed they are, they are artists first, yeah. Australians second, and deserving of yeah. more of the recognition that you are saying our artists need. Thank you so much for opening our eyes to that. And um, again, let's thank Edmund for his talk. Thank you, Rose. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs>